Mitchell and Bill Kerr. speaking to you on this bright October day in the year 1924 from the Memorial Stadium at Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Well, it's Michigan-Illinois in the gridiron today. Looks like we're in for another battle of the Giants. The kind that always occurs when the fighting Illini from the University of Illinois tangled with the Wolverines of Michigan let go with everything they've been saving up for each other. There's the Wolverine band. Let's pick them up for a minute. Your car will operate more efficiently this winter if you take a few minutes now to rid the cooling system of rust and scum. The quick and easy way is to pour a can of DuPont cooling system cleanser into the radiator and run the engine for 30 minutes or more. Then drain out the dissolved rust and scum, refill with fresh water, and add a can of DuPont cooling system sealer to guard against leaks. These DuPont automotive products are examples of better things for better living through chemistry. Back with 55,000 howling fans for this 1924 homecoming, waiting for the opening whistle to blow. But with all the excitement here today, the biggest drama and the best story centers around a 53-year-old man sitting in the stands just below me. His name, Fielding Harris Yost. This is the first time in 24 years Fielding Yost hasn't been facing up and down in front of the Michigan bench, chewing a beat-up cigar and leading his teams to more Big Ten championships than any other school in the conference. Remember those point a minute teams from 19-1 to 19-5? They played 56 exceptional games without a defeat. Never hear of Willie Heston and Germany Schultz, Dan McGugan and Harry Kipke, Yost made them, and many other gridiron immortals. And on this day in 1924, he's sitting in the stands just like anybody else watching a football game. I wonder what he's thinking about sitting there alongside of Mrs. Yost. Yes, sir, I wonder how he's enjoying it. Put that cigar back in your pocket. You're not the coach today. All right, dear. Hiya, coach. Why, that's Stan Wills. Hiya, Stan. Oh, now, Fielding, just get back in your seat and try to relax. I am relaxed. Hiya, coach. Well, hiya, Dutchman. Hello, coach. How do you feel? Hi, uh, Dutchman. For you, do you remember Germany Schultz, one of my old boys? Of course I remember him. Hiya, coach. Willie Hester. <laughs> well. Uh, say, Coach, I hear this Red Grange is Green's Lightning. They say it can't be stopped. Uh, if you were in there coaching today, uh, you'd be great. Mr. Heston, the doctor said he was not to get excited. All right, Eunice, I'm not excited. Willie, no man is unstoppable. Remember what they said about Eckersoll? Well, you and Germany stopped him. Uh, I'll say we did. Coach, do you remember the Chicago game in 1970? Chicago 1970, yeah, I remember. I remember that first Rose Bowl game against Stanford? Uh-huh, I remember. Ah, uh, remember that 70 yard for punts Sweeney made against Ohio? Remember I remember, I remember, boys. Oh, I remember it all. I want to go back, I want to go back to Michigan. I want to go back to Michigan. Yes, Mr. Yo. Remember 1901, the era of peg top trousers and parasols, when a blacksmith's forge dotted every main street, and a long hat pin was the working girl's protection against the villainous male. Yes, this was America of 1901. On the day when a young man, his arms weighted down with two bulging suitcases, stepped off a Michigan Central train. I beg your pardon, sir. Can you tell me where I'll find Mr. Charles Baird? He's the manager of athletics at Michigan. Oh, I'm Charlie Baird. Are you feeling ill? Yes, sir. Well, if you tell me where your carriage is, I'll dump my bags in. You're a younger man than I'd expected, Mr. Yost. Tell me, is it true you coached four teams simultaneously out there in California last year? Five, sir. I forgot to mention the high school team I coached in my spare time. According to your newspaper clippings, all four of those teams won championships. Five, sir. Yes, sir. Mr. Yost, do you think you can produce a winning team here at Michigan? I don't see why not. What makes you so sure? Mr. Baird, there are three things that make a winning football team. Spirit, manpower, and coaching. If your boys love Michigan, they've got the spirit somewhere in them. I'll take care of the coaching, and the rest is... Manpower. We've got over 2,000 male students. 2,000, eh? Yep. How many come out for football? About 15 or 20. 15 or 20? Yep. 
Mr. Barrett, I'm a football coach, but more than that, I'm interested in physical fitness. I don't mean just football players. I mean the entire student body. Yes, that's very interesting. You Mr. see, Yoke. I'm looking to the days after these boys have graduated and are out in the world. The habits they form in college will last a long time. Uh, about the football you team. You see, the thing to do is to get them all out for athletics. And that's what I propose to do. Athletics for all. That's the new motto at Michigan from now on. And if I... Uh, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to get all excited about it. What did you say your catch was? I didn't. Hey, but I've got two heavy suitcases. Yes, I see. Well, I came on a bicycle. Oh. And since you're such an ardent believer in exercise for everybody, you can just trot along beside me. It's only a minor mile or so to the campus, Mr. Yost. It's right up the hill. Football was a rough, tough sport in those days. With a nose guard and a shin protector, the flying wedges and mass tandem plays. 1,000 spectators of the game was considered a banner crowd, one that drew headlines in the Detroit papers. It was a few days later that the new coach had his team out on the field for a practice session. Listen, I want speed. Four plays a minute. You, Snow, and you, Wicks, get in there. Hurry. Show me some speed. You, Sammy, use your eyes. They're your searchlights. Turn them on the enemy. Use your hands. They're your attacking weapons. Meat hooks are useless unless they have meat on them. And for the love of Mike, hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. It was after one of those early practice sessions that a newspaper reporter made sports history by changing a man's name. I went out to Regent's Field today to see the new coach put his men through the paces. They say his name is Fielding Yost. This is undoubtedly a misnomer. As far as this reporter is concerned, that man's name is Hurry Up. Hurry Up, Yost. And that's how our name was born. A name that was to bring fame to Michigan. A name to become famous for fine football. Hurry Up, Yost. Hurry up, you fellas. Get your back, Mr. Hurry up. Hurry up. Hey, excuse me. There's a new student here who wants to talk to you. Wait a minute, Charlie. Everything to demonstrate it. 
One day, Yost was in his own home explaining a new play to Germany Schultz, Michigan's great all-time All-American center. The chairs and cushions were arranged in formation, and Yost was playing quarterback. Uh, Dutchman. Yeah? On this play, the end comes around as a decoy. I see. The halfback fades and comes around with him. Well. The quarterback takes the pass to the end and hands the ball. Uh, where's the ball? Ah, uh, Eunice. What can I use for the ball? Oh, dear. We haven't any football. What do you mean you haven't any... Uh, oh, I know. I know. Come here, Sonny. That's a good boy. You put that baby down, you hear? Put that baby down. Nineteen two, Michigan, 86. Ohio State, nothing. Nineteen three, Michigan, 51. Indiana, nothing. Nineteen four, Michigan, 130. West Virginia, nothing. The year 1905, total Michigan, 495. Opponent, two points. Those were the famous point-a-minute teams. Want just one more bit of statistics? Listen then, ladies and gentlemen, because you never heard anything like this. 19-1 to 19-5, total points, Michigan, 2,821. Opponents? 42. Yes, those were great teams, and great crowds came out to see them, too. Well, Charlie Baird, how do you like sitting on the bench during a football game? I like it fine, Coach. I can count the house better from here. <laughs> Quite a crowd. Must be 4,000 at least. Easy. Fielding, you've done a great job. You know something, Charlie? Someday, Michigan is going to have the finest athletic plan in the country with every conceivable kind of equipment. Sounds fine to me, Coach, but who's going to pay for it? Football. Charlie, when I came here a few years ago, these stands at Regent's Field seated 800. Now you fix them up so they hold us at 4,000. And in a couple of years, you'll fix them up again so they maybe, maybe they'll hold 10,000. And that won't be enough. Coach, if it were anyone but you telling me this, I'd put in a call to the booby. Charlie? Someday we're going to build a real stadium here at Michigan. It's going to seat 50, maybe 75,000 people. Well, who's going to pay for that? Football. Fielding, I think I will put in that call to the booby head. Wait and see, Charlie. Wait and see. You are listening to Thomas Mitchell as Fielding Yost with Bill Stern as commentator on the Cavalcade of America. Presented by the DuPont Company, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. Athletics for all. Exercise for everybody. Building Yost lived that faith. He preached it. He wrote articles about it. He talked about it. You couldn't shut him up. He told everybody about it. Uh, Coach, will you pass the bread, please? Certainly, Professor. Say, I heard your debating team lose last night over at the auditorium. Awful, weren't we? Well, things might have been different if we were up to full strength. That Somerville boy, I could wring his neck. Hey, you fellas take this thing seriously, don't you? You take football seriously, don't you? Well, it isn't the particular sports that counts, you know. It's the spirit of competition. Yeah, that's right. Of course, I never thought of it that way. So what's the matter with him, Professor? You know, young Somerville. I don't know. He's been looking kind of peaky lately. Run down, I guess. Anyhow, he never showed up last night. Wait a minute. It's tall and rangy, yes. he wears glasses. Oh, right. I know him. Probably doesn't get in a lick of exercise from one year to the next. Exercise? Coach, you're forgetting. Mr. Somerville is the intellectual type. I bet it kept Then he ought to have enough brains to take exercise. Send him around to me. I'll fix him up. But, Coach, he's not the type, by the way. He's a, he's a scholarship man on the honors list. Just what I need in my backfield. Send him around. <laughs> Morning, uh, Coach, sir. Uh, my name's Somerville. I heard you wanted to see me. That's right. Ever play football? Me? When was the last time you took any form of exercise? Well, let's see now. I uh, used to do a bit of swimming, but I had to give it up. Bad heart? No, no. No, my heart is fine. I just got tired. I'm always tired. And lately, I've had insomnia. Insomnia, eh? Okay. Go in and tell Charlie to fit you up with a uniform. Oh, Coach, you're not serious. Why, I get tired just walking from one class to another. Mr. Somerville, you're going to put on that uniform and you're going to have yourself a workout. And tonight you're going to be so doggone tired you'll sleep all right. Don't worry. Now get into that uniform. Mm. 
Well, Professor, how'd your team make out in that debate last night? We won. Unanimous decision. Coach, we were magnificent. Uh-huh. Such logic, such exposition. Glad to hear. Oh, by the way, whatever happened to young Somerville? Somerville? Best man we've got. You should have heard him. I... Incidentally, did he ever report to you that time? Yes, and he worked out for a month. Then I sent him over to the swimming coach. I understand he made the team. Really? Uh, coach, uh, don't you think, well, that is, it won't interfere with the really important things like uh, debating, for instance. Professor, exercise in the proper amount never hurt anybody. When a man is tired all the time and can't sleep... By the way, Professor, how do you sleep? Me? Why, I... Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, excuse me, Coach. I'm afraid that I'm late for my class. Uh, goodbye, Coach. Nineteen thirteen, Michigan forty-three. Syracuse seven. Nineteen seventeen, Michigan forty-two. Cornell nothing. Nineteen twenty, Michigan fourteen. Chicago nothing. Nineteen twenty-one, Michigan thirty-eight. Minnesota nothing. <laughs> Fielding Yost was appointed director of athletics. He continued to serve as football coach without pay through 1923. It was coming on towards Thanksgiving that year when a rather serious discussion took place between Mr. and Mrs. Yost and their family physician. Fielding, I told you before and I tell you again, you've got to give up coaching. No more football. Not me, Doctor. Why, I wouldn't know what to do with myself. You could go on a trip to Europe, dear, with me. Mm. We could visit all those battlefields you're always talking about. That's an excellent idea. But why the battlefield? Are you a military expert, Fielding? <laughs> of course he is. He knows more about the Napoleonic Wars than any professor at the university. Now, Eunice, does this great interest have anything to do with football? Oh, well, you see... Come yeah. on, out with it. Doc, that those old battlefields are an inspiration to a football coach. Why, I've learned more strategy by studying Napoleon's campaign. Take the Battle of Waterloo, for instance. Now, Napoleon was over here where that chair is. Blucher was lined up over there near the Victrola. Uh, now, where's the baseball? Eunice! Is there a baseball in the house? On the doctor's orders, Yost resigned as football coach at the end of the 1923 season. He was tired out, for Fielding Yost was not only interested in football. He had a law degree, and he was a businessman who developed a hydroelectric plant in Tennessee. The following year, 1924... One of the greatest football players of all time was running wild. Red Grange, the galloping ghost. And this, as the saying goes, is where we came in. Remember the beginning of this story? We're back to that game. The game that started the old coach and his star pupils, Heston and Schultz, reminiscing. And as the first quarter got underway, Red Grange lived up to his advance notices. I mean, he ran wild as Ghost watched him suffer. Oh, you there, Ed Ed. He cut back on you. You let yourself get boxed in. You, you were the secondary. Oh, where did you ever learn to play football? Wake up, wake up. You're playing for Michigan. Feel sit down. Please don't get so excited. I can't help it. I can't help it. Great guns, four touchdowns in the first quarter against Michigan. I can't stand it, I tell you. I can't stand it. That game ended. Illinois 39, Michigan 14. Needless to say, the next year, Fielding H. Yost was again in charge of football at Michigan. The doctor decided that not being coach was too much excitement for him. It's 1925 now, one year later. The locker room a few minutes before another Illinois game. All right, all right, now down, 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 everyone. Now you... Yes, sir. I want you to do it this way. You don't go in, and you don't let yourself get boxed. You just keep running, Benny, parallel with Grange, forcing him toward the sideline. Got it, Coach. And you won't touch him. You won't even try to touch him. You'll just ooze him out toward the sidelines and out of bounds. You get it? Gotcha. Now, now this is for everybody. Use your eyes, use your hands, and use your heads, and you backs. Move in fast. Last year against these babies, something happened that never happened before. We had four touchdowns scored against us in the first quarter. That won't happen today. Not if you carry out your assignments. Remember, you're representing a great school with a great tradition. No, tradition isn't something you can put on like a coat. It's got to be built up day by day. 
Love for the school, love for the game, love for the team. That's what makes men and wins games and builds up tradition. Now go on out in there and help build it up for Michigan. Play like a Michigan team. That afternoon, the Michigan team went out on the field and stopped Red Grange cold. Then, as a result of Benny Friedman's field goal, Michigan won three to nothing. And another well-coached team from Ann Arbor was on its way to another Big Ten championship. Then came the day when Fielding Yost's great dream was realized. The magnificent new stadium was completed at Michigan. On that eventful afternoon, Fielding Yost and old Charlie Baird looked down from the topmost row of seats, down on a jam-packed crowd of 85,000 men and women. And then... They looked at each other. 85,000, Charlie. And they all came out to see a football game. Oh, Yost. Mr. Yost. Phil. Phil Stern. Hiya, Bill. What are you doing in Ann Arbor? Well, I came out to cover the dedication at the Yost Fieldhouse. Really? Good. Uh, say, uh, have you got a minute to talk to me? Sure thing. Uh, would you uh, tell me a little about those great point-a-minute Michigan teams of yours? Not today, Bill. The day I don't want to look backward. I only want to think about this new athletic plant we have right here at Michigan. That certainly is a honey. I hear you build a golf course, yes, too. Yes, and 63 tennis courts and three swimming pools and a hockey rink and everything else you can think of. You know where it all came from? Hmm? Football. Coach, on my sports program tonight... I want to tell the people of America all about you and what you've done here at Michigan. Is there anything special you want me to say? Special? Yes. There's something I've been thinking about for a long time. And that's this. That we should never forget that America was developed and settled by a race of workers. And that the human body today is the same as it was when our forefathers lived by physical work. So today we must not get soft. It's a fact known to every reader of history that when any people develop too large a percentage of idlers, that people has been destroyed. We have a responsibility to ourselves and the future, future generations. So let's stay in the game. championship Michigan team of this year knows him as only a memory, but Fielding Yost is not forgotten. Wherever football is played, he'll be remembered, for there are those who keep alive his spirit, and they'll tell you that on a cold, clear, wintry night out in Ann Arbor, you can still hear his famous never-to-be-forgotten shout ringing out in the silent stadium. Hurry up! Use your eyes! Use your hands! for DuPont. Nowadays, more people eat their breakfasts, and sometimes other meals too, in the kitchen or in a breakfast nook. The saying used to be, come out of the kitchen, mother. Now we go into the kitchen with mother. The reason is that a kitchen today, its accessories gleaming white with DuPont Dulux and Duco finishes, is one of the pleasantest rooms in the house. The youngsters do their homework on the kitchen table. Even dad, tiptoes out to the refrigerator when he ought to be in bed and goes through the leftovers like a snowplow. 
Every woman wants a spick and span kitchen with a sink gleaming and the floor so clean you can eat off it. But with kitchens coming in for greater and greater use, and with children in and out of the house all day, keeping a kitchen clean is a problem. Here's one way to make the job easier. Use a cleanable tablecloth in the kitchen or breakfast nook and clean it with a damp cloth. Cleanable fabric tablecloths are a development of chemical science. They are made in an entirely different way from the old-fashioned coated fabric tablecloths. The plastic now is bonded to the fabric in such a way that it actually penetrates into it and becomes part of it. The whole cloth is flexible and pliant. The DuPont Company was one of the first companies to make coated fabrics, you know. We've been making them since 1910. In those days, most automobiles had rubberized cloth tops, and many had DuPont fabricoid upholstery. For 37 years, DuPont has manufactured coated fabrics for book bindings, upholstery and luggage, and tontine washable window shade cloth. And now, Fabrolite vinyl plastic coated tablecloths. We think our new Fabrolite tablecloths are the best ever. The colors and designs are gay and attractive. And all you need to do to clean them is moisten the cloth and wipe them off. They're clean in a jiffy. Fabrolite plastic tablecloths, on sale at leading department stores, are among DuPont's better things for better living through chemistry. Now we introduce Janet Graves, managing editor of Screen Guide magazine. Thank you, Mr. Whitman. On behalf of the motion picture industry... Screen Guide presents a special award to the DuPont Cavalcade for its vital contribution to our national life. With the assistance of important players of the screen, this series portrays experiences and achievements that represent the best part of our heritage. Screen Guide consi considers it a privilege to make this award tonight to the DuPont Cavalcade of America. Thank you, Miss Graves, for the DuPont Company and for all of us who work on Cavalcade. Cavalcade presents George Tobias in an original and unusual radio play called Us Pilgrims, the story of an immigrant and Thanksgiving. Be with us again next Monday night and listen to George Tobias in Us Pilgrims on the DuPont Cavalcade of America. The original music for the DuPont Cavalcade was composed by Arden Cornwell and conducted by Donald Bryan. Tonight's play was written by Arthur Aaron. Thomas Mitchell is currently starring in the Broadway production and Inspector Call. And Bill Stern, in addition to his football broadcast, may be heard on his sports newsreel Friday nights over many of these stations. This is Bill Hamilton inviting you to listen next week to Us Children. Starring George Tobias on the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.